Amen. Thank you, Dr. Tony and choir and all our musicians. You always do such a splendid job. I always wonder, how am I going to follow that uh, whenever uh, I get the opportunity to uh, finally get up here? Well, we'll be in Acts chapter 10 this morning, so you can be finding that. And while you are finding that, I want to say a couple of things and my intention is never to embarrass anybody, but I was sitting in the truck this morning looking over my text for this morning. Always wise to review one's text. Uh, I just happened to notice, I don't know where you, there you are over there, Jeremy and his family uh, walking in. And then I came in the sanctuary and I noticed Terry back there. And you know, I just thought about you know, the pretty significant losses you uh, suffered this past week when the storm moved through and God knows it could have been a whole lot worse. And there may be others here that uh, suffered some loss that I'm not aware of, so I'm not trying to leave anybody out. But, you know, I thought to myself, I suspect the reason that they're here this morning is because despite all of their losses, they would still say, God has been good. And their identity is not in all their stuff. Their identity is in Jesus. And their hope is not in all their earthly possessions and all of their what we might say earthly riches. Their hope is in Jesus and the fact that Jesus died and rose again. And I know we, you know, sometimes we lose sight of all this, but uh, just seeing you show up this morning, Jeremy, just kind of brought it uh, home for me. And I just think, it, you know, it would be appropriate if we would just take a few moments to pause and offer a, a prayer of thanksgiving to God for just being who he is and for the fact that he has been good uh, to all of us uh, this past week. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for being good to us. And Lord, we know you're good to us because you're a good God. You're a good, good Father, as the song says. And Father, you always do what is good and what is right and what is best. And Lord, sometimes we are reminded through difficult and challenging circumstances that our hope is not in this world. Our hope is in Jesus. So Father, I just want to thank you that this past week as storms moved through the area and as some of our folks right here this morning suffered some significant losses, Father, we're just thankful there was no loss of life. And we're thankful, Father, that just like any other difficult challenge we may face, we'll get through this too because you'll be with us and you'll walk with us. In fact, you're with us now and you're walking with us now. And Father, we just thank you so much that our hope doesn't rest in what we own here. Our hope rests in Jesus and the fact that Jesus died and rose again. And Father, although we celebrate that every Sunday, really every day of the year as believers, we especially focus on it today. And we thank you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we can move on to the sermon. Acts chapter 10, and as you're turning to Acts chapter 10, the title of the message is, We Are Witnesses of These Things. So as we work through the text and as we think about what Luke is writing about and what Peter is preaching about, we really want to center in on the fact that he's preaching about the resurrection and not just a resurrection he heard about but one that he actually witnessed. He actually saw the risen Lord. So let's, let's read our text together this morning, Acts chapter 10, and we'll begin in verse 34. And if you're able, uh, let me encourage you to stand with me as we read our text together. Beginning in verse 34, Luke writes, and this is speaking of Peter here, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, 
He is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all these things that he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse water for those for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. May God add his blessings to the reading, hearing, and the understanding of his word. Uh, you may be seated. Well, the book of Acts gives us the record of the spread of Christianity from the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost until the Apostle Paul's arrival in Rome to preach the gospel in the capital of the Roman Empire. The book itself covers approximately 30 years, and it, and it, it, it covers the earliest of church history and some important years of transition in the early church. Uh, we find that the gospel was first preached to Jews, and the early church was largely made up of Jewish believers. But as the gospel continued to spread, more and more Gentiles were included until the church really became distinct from Judaism. And even today, uh, when the world looks at the church, the Christian church, they look at it not as a Jewish body, but a body made up mostly of those who would not identify uh, with the Jewish faith in any way, shape, or form. The New Testament doctrines, that is, what the New Testament teaches about certain things, such as the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God, church leadership, Gentile salvation, that's us, what the, what, what the New Testament teaches about these things, we find them in what we might say early seed form in the book of Acts. The book of Acts lays down the principles of missionary work. So if you want to be a missionary on a foreign land, uh, you will likely use the principles that we find here in the book of Acts for your missionary service. The book reveals the patterns for church life. And we know from archaeological discoveries that have been made, specifically some in recent years, that what Luke writes here, it is an accurate accounting of the early church. And that's important because the Christian faith is built upon facts and knowledge about those facts. So in other words, our faith is not a blind faith. Our faith is a no-so faith. We believe because we know these things to be true. And God uh, throughout history has, has demonstrated over and over and over again the truthfulness of his word and what is revealed in scripture. And the book of Acts here is, is no different. There are archeological discoveries that undergird and support uh, all that is written here in the book of Acts. And so our faith is a no-so faith. It is not a, oh Lord, I hope so kind of faith, but a no-so faith. Our faith is built upon facts. The first 12 chapters of the book include important figures like Peter, who we will hear from this morning, and Stephen, and Philip, and Barnabas, and James, and then beginning in chapter 13 through the end of the book, the focus really comes down on the Apostle Paul and how he became, uh, how God called him out of darkness and saved him and set him apart to preach the gospel primarily to Gentiles. And so the rest of the book will deal with that. The book can also be divided into the geographical divisions mentioned uh, back in chapter 1, verse 8. And I'll just read that uh, to us quickly. Most of us here this morning, we're probably familiar with uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. 
Uh, we might even say that it's the other great commission, the first one that we know most people know about in Matthew 28. But he says in verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. And so the flow of Acts begins in Jerusalem. It moves into Judea and Samaria and then it moves to the remotest parts of the earth. Even down to today, the gospel is still being proclaimed all the way around the world, even to what's some places in the world that we might refer to as some really remote areas. The gospel is still being proclaimed. So some uh, rightly say today that the book of Acts, in a sense, is still being written today as the Holy Spirit continues to take the gospel through believers and spread it around the world. So... The book of Acts can be divided into these geographical divisions that we see there in chapter 1, verse 8. But the events that we are concerned about this morning here in Acts chapter 10, these events take place approximately 7 to 10 years after the resurrection. So the point that I want to make here this morning is that even though it's 7 or 10 years after the resurrection, all these years later the disciples are still proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus Christ as foundational to the gospel message. Likewise, a second point is that this message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the church is still proclaiming this message today. All these years later, some 2,000 plus years later, the church is still proclaiming the message of the resurrection. And guess what? I am proclaiming the message of the resurrection to you this morning. All of you who are gathered here today, I proclaim to you the message of the resurrection, that Jesus died and rose again. If you're watching by Facebook, same message. Jesus died and rose again. If you're listening on the radio, same message. Jesus died and rose again. All these uh, hundreds, 2,000 plus years later, Jesus died and rose again. We're still proclaiming that message. And that's the message we're going to see here this morning uh, that Peter is proclaiming to Cornelius and his household. So when it, when it comes to the resurrection and all the events surrounding the life of Christ, we must remember all the apostles and many in the early church were witnesses to all these things. So they saw these things with their eyes. They were witnesses to all these things. And Peter even uh, specifically mentions that in our text this morning, that he was witness to all these things. The fact that Jesus lived, that he died, that he was buried, and that he rose again. So Acts chapter 10 then is one of the most important chapters in the whole book of Acts. And if you consider it in the whole flow of Scripture, it's really one of the most important chapters in all the Bible. Why? Because it tells us how a gospel, and remember the word gospel means good news, and so when we say we're proclaiming the gospel, we're proclaiming the good news that Jesus died and rose again. But it tells how a gospel that was originally thought of in exclusively Jewish terms was actually for the whole world. So it wasn't just limited to Jews. It was for both Jews and Gentiles. And remember, a Gentile is anybody who's not a Jew. So I would suspect that most every one of us uh, here this morning, we, are, we would identify uh, with Gentiles because I don't know of any of us this morning who would say we're Jewish. Uh, maybe there's one or two here. If there are, please come see me afterwards because I'm always fascinated to hear from someone uh, who was raised in Judaism but has come to faith in Jesus as Messiah. But think about this. For all of our many differences such as ethnicities and creed and culture and gender and nationality, people all over the world have one thing in common. What's that one thing? Sin. We all have sin in common, and we could probably add to that prejudice, which is oftentimes a form of sin. But you know what? The gospel overcomes all of that. It overcomes all of our sin, all of our prejudices, and the importance of this is seen in the fact that Luke deals with it three different times here in Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 11, and then over in Acts chapter 15, how the gospel overcomes prejudices. As we delve into our text this morning, I want us to think about five words. I think I gave you four or five words last time uh, I preached, but this will help us to consider the whole chapter, but especially our text this morning, and the words are place, and by that we're speaking of the context, you know, where, do, where does Acts chapter 10 uh, fall in the flow of all this, and we've really already considered much of that 
in the introduction, but we'll make a couple of points about that. And then preparation, verses 1 through 23. Proclamation, verses 34 through 43. Proof, uh, verses 44 through 46. And profession, verses 47 through uh, 48. So let's just work through our text. And remember, as we're working through our text, we're primarily concerned with the person of Jesus, his life and his work, and the resurrection in particular, things to which, as I've already said, the apostles and the folks in the early church, many of the folks in the early church, they were eyewitnesses to these things. So again, our faith does not rest on, oh Lord, I hope so, but oh Lord, I know so, because we have eyewitness accounts of all these things. So let's consider the place or the context of Acts chapter 10. So. As previously stated, the events of Acts 10 are occurring as early as seven years and as late as 10 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and yet they're still proclaiming the message of the resurrection. Uh, and today we're still proclaiming that message, and I am proclaiming that message to you this morning, that Jesus died and rose again. And so this is taking place several years after the resurrection itself, but we still it's still early enough in church history that we still have eyewitnesses who are able to attest to these things. So what is happening here in this chapter is God is getting ready to advance the gospel now that has been primarily uh, hanging around Jerusalem and maybe in Judea and Samaria, some of the uh, parts of the, that area that were close to Jerusalem. He's about to advance that now to the Gentiles. So the gospel is about to really begin to spread uh, beyond Jerusalem. And so that's what's going on here. And so God prepares uh, two people for what is about to take place. He, he prepares Cornelius, and he also prepares Peter. And I have to remember to turn around and preach to the choir this morning. I, I keep forgetting y'all are behind me. But, you know, you've heard folks say, you're preaching to the choir. Well, this morning I get to do it. So hopefully <laughs> hopefully I'll remember to, to turn around and include you guys in that. But God is preparing Cornelius to receive the gospel, and he's preparing Peter to take the gospel and present it to Cornelius here in uh, chapter 10 of Acts. And so uh, there are two visions. Cornelius has one in verses 1 through 8. We're not going to take the time to read the text this morning, but, but we see there, if you, want, if you go back later and look at those verses, that God has been preparing Cornelius to hear and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then Peter, who is obviously a Jew and would consider uh, many things to be unclean based on the Old Testament law and, and would never go into the house of a uh, Gentile, especially to fellowship, because he may come into contact with something that is unclean. God gives him a vision too. And as you read through chapter 10, uh, the timing of what's taking place, Cornelius has a vision. He sends men to uh, find the apostle Peter and to ask him to come uh, to Cornelius' house uh, with a message from God. And just as those gentlemen that are servants that Cornelius had sent are arriving at the house that Peter's staying in, Peter's having a vision. And so it's like the timing is just perfect and God is preparing him to, to hear from these messengers and to go with them to share the gospel with Cornelius. So Acts chapter 1 verses 1, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 10 verses 1 through 8 tell us that Cornelius was a devout man who feared God with his household. He was a Roman soldier who feared, feared God even before he came to a full understanding of the gospel. And not only was he about to become a believer in Jesus himself, but God was going to use him to spread the gospel to other Gentiles as well. And although he was a devout man, although he was what we might call a God-fearer, these traits were not able to save him. And the same is true today. We must have faith in Jesus. And we must believe that Jesus died and rose again. Think about this. Here was a man, Cornelius, who was religious. He was devout. He was sincere. He was earnest. He was generous. And he was prayerful. These are all qualities that we really like to see in Christians today. But they are not necessarily indicative of someone who has been saved. So you may have all these qualities, but you may have never come to that point in your life where you actually placed your faith and your trust in Jesus. 
You see, Cornelius had all these traits, but he was still lost because he had not heard the gospel and he had not believed the gospel. But what we see here is that these traits can often indicate a heart that is ready to receive the gospel and believe in Jesus Christ. And so that's what happens here as Peter comes uh, here uh, beginning in verse 34 and he begins to proclaim the message of salvation to Cornelius. And so his proclamation has seven points. Usually my sermons have three points, but we're going to take Peter's this morning. Seven points. Are y'all ready? Seven points. Here we go. We're going to move quickly. Number one, and remember, Peter is focusing primarily on the person, life, and work of Jesus. And all of these things, including the resurrection, are things to which he was what? An eyewitness. He saw it. And so we have eyewitness testimony here. And he says in verses 34 and 35 that, that God does not show partiality. So basically what that means is that you and I, everyone really, we're all on a level playing field when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We either believe it or we don't. And so he says here in verse 34, opening his mouth, of course, Peter has just had this vision uh, one or two days earlier about the sheep being lowered that had all kinds of animals on it. God says, take, kill, and eat. And he says, no, Lord, I, I will never uh, touch anything unclean. This happens three times, and then the vision is taken, taken up from him. And, and through that, Peter comes to realize that the gospel is not just for Jews. It's also for Gentiles. And so in verse 34, he says, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. And so, so Peter is saying that, that he understands that God is not only at work within Judaism, but he is at work out in the world in the hearts of what we might call Gentiles, preparing them to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he's not talking about a work salvation here. He's simply saying that, that he understands now that God has prepared Cornelius' heart and by extension uh, your heart and mine to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the point here is that God has in his grace prepared Cornelius to hear and to receive and to believe the gospel. But he first must hear it. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So God shows no partiality. That's point number one. Point number two, verse 36, he says, almost in a parenthetical kind of way, he says, Jesus is Lord of all. Notice verse 36. He says, the word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. By the way, Cornelius, Jesus is Lord of all. Paul, Peter's point there is that Jesus is sovereign and that God the Father has made God the Son Lord of Overall, So he's not only king of kings, he's Lord of lords. And peace with God is possible only through Jesus Christ. So Jesus is sovereign. Peace with him or peace with God the Father is only possible through faith in Jesus Christ. And then in verses 37 through 38, he summarizes the life of Jesus. You, verse 37, you yourselves know, so he's telling Cornelius, you know some of these things already the things which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee after the baptism which John proclaimed. And then verse 38, he talks about how Jesus went about uh, the countryside and how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he did good, how he healed those who were oppressed by the devil. Uh, God was with him. In verse 39, he talks about the death of Jesus, and he says, notice the title of our message, we are witnesses of all the things he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a cross. Verse 40, he talks about the resurrection. He says, God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible not to all the people. In other words, Jesus didn't appear after his resurrection, for example, to the Pharisees and Sadducees who had handed him over to the Romans to be put to death. They had already rejected him. So why in the world would he appear to them? So when Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to those who had already begun to express faith or had outright expressed faith in him as the Messiah on the front side of his crucifixion and resurrection. So after his resurrection, he began to appear to some of those to really to confirm uh, 
that everything he had said and predicted about himself, especially his death and his resurrection, was true. It's one thing for someone to say, when I die, three days later, I'm going to rise again, and 2,000 years later, they still be in the dirt. But it's something else altogether for someone to say, I'm going to die, and three days later, I'm going to rise again, and three days later, they rise again. And Jesus did that. And so, so Peter deals with that here in his very brief message to Cornelia. He says, uh, again, in verse 40, God raised him up. That is Jesus. God raised Jesus up on the third day and granted that he become visible, uh, not to all the people, but to the witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he, he throws that little part in there about eating and drinking with Jesus just to make a point. You don't eat and drink with a ghost. You know, so Jesus physically arose from the dead in his glorified body yes but he physically arose from the dead and in that glorified body he was still able to eat and drink just like we eat and drink today and so uh, he deals with the death of Jesus he deals with the resurrection of Jesus and then his sixth point is he deals with Jesus as future judge in verse 42 he says and he ordered us to preach to the people and to solemnly testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. And so Jesus is the one before whom you and I as believers will one day stand before the judgment of seat of Christ, and we will be rewarded uh, for our service to him here in our physical bodies on this earth. But he will also sit as judge on that great white throne at the end of his thousand-year reign on this earth. That's over in Revelation uh, chapters 20, 21 uh, deal with that, that all the unbelievers of all time will stand before him at some point uh, in the future, and Jesus will act as their judge as well, only he will not be rewarding them uh, for service to him because there is no service to him. In that case, uh, what will be happening is uh, they will be uh, judged for their sin. They will be judged for the fact that they rejected Jesus and everything that God offered them through Jesus Christ. And so he will sit as future judge. But then he says a seventh point here in verse 43, but, uh, he says that Jesus is Savior. Notice he says in verse 43, of all of, of him, all of the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sin. So Jesus is Savior. So Peter summarizes the person life, work, resurrection, and future judgment in just a few short verses. I've been going about 25 minutes, but I think Peter uh, probably did this in just a few moments. He just went through a very simple summary of Jesus' life, his ministry, his death, his burial, his resurrection, future judgment, the fact that he is the one that the prophets uh, had spoken about. And, and Cornelius, although he was familiar with some of the things about Jesus, I doubt he was familiar with the Old Testament prophecies. And so uh, Peter just kind of summarized that quickly in verse 43, that he's the one that all the prophets uh, wrote about. So thinking about that, you know, all of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, it, it points to Jesus. It points to Jesus. And so he summarizes all this in just a few short verses, that Jesus was baptized, and that baptism was in, in identification with humanity. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good. Uh, he, he healed others. He delivered those oppressed by the devil. By the way, Jesus is still delivering uh, those oppressed by the devil today. He's still rescuing people out of the kingdom of darkness. He did this with the power of God, for God was with him, Peter said. He did these things in the presence of eyewitnesses. He was crucified. He was raised from the dead. Uh, he commanded his followers to proclaim this message. Uh, one of these days he's coming as judge, and all of this was foretold, foretold by the prophets. And the Gentiles would not have known all these things necessarily about what the prophets had written, but Peter summarizes it for us in verse 43. And verse 43 is a key verse here because it is here that he says that through him or through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. You want to be forgiven this morning? believe in Jesus. You want to receive 
eternal life this morning and the hope of the resurrection and all of that, then receive Jesus Christ. Place your faith and your trust in Jesus. Now, what does it mean to believe? Well, it's not just head knowledge, but a heart knowledge. It's a firm conviction of the truth of the gospel of Jesus. So it's like your head is hearing these things I'm saying this morning, but the Holy Spirit is convincing you in your heart that these things are true. So, it, so when that happens, you make a personal surrender to the truth of Jesus. And then you live your life like someone who has placed their faith and their trust in Jesus. It is always faith in Christ alone. Our fourth word, proof. What was the proof here? Well, verse 44, notice, while Peter was still speaking these words. Now, does that sound familiar? If you were here a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the transfiguration, Peter is up on the mountain with Jesus and two other disciples, and Jesus is glorified before them or transfigured before them, and Peter just starts babbling, 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 and the Bible says while Peter was still speaking, God spoke. So Peter's kind of used to that by now. And so Peter is speaking. He's sharing the gospel. And you can almost hear him taking a breath and getting ready to move into the next part of his presentation. And the Bible says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those listening to the message. So it was like God was saying, all right, Peter, you've said everything I need you to say. You've talked about who Jesus is. You've talked about what he came to do. You've talked about the fact that he died, that he was buried, that he was resurrected. That's all I need from you, Peter. I can take it from here. And the Holy Spirit falls upon these people. And, and, and the implication there is their eyes are open to the truth about who Jesus is and what he has accomplished. And by faith, they receive the message of the gospel, the simple gospel message that Jesus died that he was buried, and that he rose again. And the proof of their faith is in that while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell. And this so amazed those who were with Peter. They were other Jews who were with Peter. The Bible says in verse 45, all the circumcised believers, that is all the Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. And so the, uh, the whole idea of tongues here was not to set some kind of precedent for the, for the whole of church history, but it was a way of proving to the Jews that the gospel that had originally come to Jews had now come to Gentiles also, that the same Holy Spirit that the, Gent that the Jews had received was now being given to the Gentiles. And notice that this happens before their baptism, not after, because in verse uh, 47, Peter says, Surely no one here can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And so what we see here is the Holy Spirit affirms or proves their salvation in verse 46. And then as we move into verse 47, we see their profession, their, their public profession of faith in Christ Jesus because that's what baptism is in verse 48. And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. So they, they were commanded to be baptized because they had believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the person and work of Jesus. The Holy Spirit had come upon them, had fallen upon them, had, had sealed their hearts forever in Christ. And because of that, Peter says, we can't refuse baptism for these people that the Holy Spirit has come upon who have, who have placed their faith and trust in Christ. And so they baptized them on the spot. Sometimes I think maybe we should have on the spot baptism. Problem is the baptistry doesn't always have water in it. So uh, I guess we do have to plan ahead a little bit. But if you placed your faith and your trust in Christ, the teaching of Scripture is that the natural, normal next step for you is that you follow through with what we would call believer's baptism, that you be baptized into the body uh, of a, a local body of believers, such as us here at uh, First Baptist Church this morning, that you, would, that you would unite with a local body of believers, that you would proclaim to the world through your baptism that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. So Peter's saying, you believed, now profess your belief publicly. Now, what about you? Have you believed the gospel of Jesus Christ? 
that Jesus was a real person, that he lived on this earth, that he was God come in human flesh. He's fully God, fully man. We won't get into all that this morning. The Bible doesn't say you have to understand it. It just says you have to believe it, that you have to believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be and that he died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried, and on the third day, we call it Easter or Resurrection Sunday, he rose from the dead. The Bible says if you believe that, if you'll place your faith and trust in Jesus, if you'll believe that gospel message, that God will not only forgive you of your sins, past, present, and future, but he'll save you. He'll save you right now, and he'll keep you saved all the way into eternity. Notice again what he said in verse 43. Of him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, notice what he says, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. That word belief there is in the uh, active voice. So the, the writers here were concerned about right now, not so much about what you might have done last week, last month, back there somewhere, but do you believe right now? Right now, do you believe the gospel? Right now, are you willing to place your faith and your trust in Jesus? And right now, are you willing to make that public before others that you have placed your faith and your trust in Jesus? Now listen, I'm not so ignorant that I can't figure this out, that, you know, in a crowd this size, there's probably one or more people here this morning. You've never placed your faith and your trust in Jesus. Listen, none of us are promised tomorrow, so I just want to encourage you, if you fall in that category, just place your faith and your trust in Jesus today. Don't wait. Don't put it off because none of us have the promise of tomorrow. You might be thinking, well, I've been coming to this church for years. What are people going to think? Listen, when you stand before God, nobody's going to be looking over your shoulder to see what you and God are talking about. If you've never placed your faith and your trust in Jesus, I encourage you to do it today. Uh, you may be here and you've been visiting with us for a long time and, and God's spoken to your heart and, said, and he has told you, this is where I want you to unite with a local body of believers and, and become a part of this church and begin to serve me here and to to proclaim the gospel here in this community. We want to encourage you to be obedient to that call as well. But more importantly is the call to salvation. If you've never believed, if you've never placed your trust in Christ, then I want to encourage you this morning to just...